You're listening to The Artist Athlete, episode 9, honey. Hello, friends, fans, and enemies. I'm Shannon McKenna, and I'm the host of The Artist Athlete podcast. This podcast is dedicated to circus. It is a resource for those working in the industry to share our stories, viewpoints, and information, and a place for outsiders to get a sneak peek into our world. My guest on today's show is Fred Deb. And before I even begin to read her bio, I want to issue an apology to Fred, to you all, and to the entire French-speaking world for my pronunciation. I know I sound as dumb as I feel reading some of these names and titles, so like, just chill and rest assured that I know, and I'm sorry about it. But that's not going to stop me from doing it. Okay, here we go. Fred Deb studied circus at Le Centre National d'Art du Cirque in Chalon in Champagne, France. Sometimes people call this school the CNAC, C-N-A-C, kind of like how the École Nationale du Cirque uh, is a, it's a notable circus school in Montreal, and that's sometimes referred to as ENC. It was during her studies that she became one of the founders of Ariel Silks. Since her debut with the company Les Azos, she has led a demanding career that reflects her taste for excellence. Every summer, she hosts an aerial dance festival in France, led by internationally renowned professors. The meetings are accompanied by a programming of multicultural performances and a number of conferences, debates, and film screenings. She is a creator of the company Drapi Alien, which takes a quirky, poetic look at the world through aerial and contemporary dance and continually seeks new opportunities to surprise and excite audiences. Today, Fred continues to ask questions through her aerial work. Her current creations are underpinned by the reflection that our lives follow lines that intersect consistently with the other, and it is often through the other that we manage to define ourselves. This internal-external relationship led her to develop a language where the bodies are based in the material of the moment. The choreography, circus techniques, costumes, set design, music, text, they all come together on stage to sublimate a dramaturgy of everyday life. Here's my interview with Fred Deb. Fred Deb, welcome Hello. to the podcast. It's so <laughs> nice to have you here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you to invite me. Of course. Yes. My pleasure. So um, can you talk a little bit about who you are, what you do? I always like to hear artists speak about their own selves and their own work. Yeah, so I'm a French aerialist, actually, and uh, I started in a circus school. I did the Centre National des Arts du Cirque uh, in Chalon Champagne in France. So I'm graduated one of the first promotion. So it means that I'm doing circus from a long time, you know. Yeah. Such a long time, actually. So even maybe almost for, uh, 30 years. And did you, when you were little, were you a dancer, gymnast? I was a movement? gymnast, yes. Okay. I did uh, almost 10 years of gymnastic okay. when I was young. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what's the, what was the audition process for the school? Oh, you know, uh, when, I, when I did it, it was a long time ago. So there is just a, an audition. You have, to, you have to present an act. Okay. And I was doing a duet trapeze act with a partner. And um, yes, we did the audition and uh, we had only this to do. And then we have few, uh, few classes, theaters and dance classes. But it was very, actually, it was quite simple. Yeah. Compared compare to now, how, how hard is the process to, to go to a circus school? Yeah, it's yes. very competitive now. Yes, 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 yes. It's so, 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 so totally different. It's such, such a big difference now. It's so, you have to, to do a preparation. You have to do a preparation school. They have like the preparatory schools, yes. but even the audition yes. is like usually like... You have to do a preparatory school mm-hmm. before, yes. And this is, this is quite a long, long time, you know. So, so you do your own studies and then you have two years. And then you, 
you can you can audition for a circus school. Yeah. So the level it's quite hard now. And why did you audition for the school? I just think that I have to I discover the circus, I discover people who were doing circus on some uh, a company and they were giving classes and I just said I think, oh my God, this is what I have to do. And I stopped my <laughs> studies. I stopped everything to go. And my, my family was totally unhappy with this. <laughs> For a few years, I mean, even maybe at the beginning of my career, they were totally like, what she's doing? <laughs> they couldn't understand me. <laughs> yeah, my family is the same. They're like, I don't know. What she does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was difficult. It was difficult to convince them. Well, I hope now they're convinced. <laughs> oh, I all these think years so. later. Yeah. I think so. But now, yes. Yes, for sure. What was, uh, what was the actual school like? Did you do duo trapeze the whole time in school as well? Uh, no, because then my partner didn't want to stay to the school. So we okay. did it for one year. And then I decided to stay because... When I, when I started the school, I discovered how many things I have to learn, you know, and practice. And uh, yes, so I decided that I have to pass uh, four years in the circus school to really become uh, good enough. Mm -hmm. So to improve my technique and uh, yes. So then I did three years by myself as a solo, soloist. Okay. And I, I was doing uh, aerial hoop, huh? you know, aerial rotating hoop. So okay. fixing by two points and swinging, rotating hoop. This is my first um, uh, apparatus and then rope. The fabric didn't exist at, the, at this time. So I did, uh, yes, hoop and uh, rope. When did fabric come into existence for you? Um, during, during the school, actually, we were working. There is a few group of, of students and we were working on a rope. And we were discovering all this noise, and we were basically uh, really researching. It was a lot of research. Yeah. And um, at a certain point, uh, some people say, "Ah, oh, yes, we can we can change rope to to fabrics." And uh, especially Gerard Fazoli says he was a teacher there, and he said, "Ah, oh, yes, guys, you have to try different apparatus." And it was really. Uh, it was like this, the circus school at this time. You know, everybody was looking for new apparatus, new material, new way of doing circus, actually. It was really an experimentation school. So um, it happened during my studies, but I graduated with rope. And then I start when I was a, an artist, I started to do fabric. Okay. Yeah. And what was your first uh, performance or contract out of the school? Uh, you know, I was... I was working with this uh, with this company. I don't know if you heard about it, but uh, Les Arceaux. Okay. It's a huge, very famous uh, trapeze company, French trapeze company. And we were so so. I graduated with this. Uh, it was a group of uh, students, and I graduated with them. And then we decided to become a company. And then we did a company, Les Arceaux, and then we turned for for a long, long time. Yes, wow. we were in they, They're still working, maybe they were touring for maybe uh, 18 years or something. Yeah, but I stopped before, but yes. Okay. And it was a huge, huge company. Uh, so did you use the material then? You graduated from the school and that material became the first show that you all did or created or you made something completely new? Uh, no, it's L, but it was, uh, it was a flying trapeze artist. So okay. it was a group of flying trapeze. So I was, I was, a, uh, I was not a flying trapeze. I was a, how do you say this? A static? Static. Trapeze? Static. Yeah, static. fixed trapeze. Fixed yeah. trapeze, yes. Yeah. So, so rope and fix uh, okay. hoop. And they, okay. were, they were doing a flying trapeze. Okay. Yes. And it was a performance only, only with aerialist. So, and then you, I was looking on your website, you've been hired by really big brands, Christian Dior, Louis Vuitton, BMW, all of these. Uh, when did that work start for you? You know, it was at the, yeah, it was at the beginning of 2000, you know. Okay. There is so many gigs and many, many, yeah, there is a lot of people who wanted to, to have a aerialist uh, for gigs. And uh, we were not so many people who were doing this. So we were some uh, few artists and uh, I was living in Paris and a friend of mine just, you know, we had so many contracts, we were working with so many agencies. 
it's happen like uh, like this you know people know you and they ask to work with you and then somebody else and it's it was a community and the community was not so big so we were not so many people so we were working a lot we had a lot of work has it changed much in france because i know in the us people always talk about the early 2000s being this time where like there was a lot of work for aerialists um, and in the states now because it's so popular um, the work is not so prevalent is it the same in france i think so yes okay. for this kind of work okay there is maybe more and more company and i'm not sure if there is more and more work for all these company but for sure there yeah. is less gigs than it was before yes okay yes i think also it's because at this time um, there is no the, it, it was not already the explosion of the digital work you know what I mean so after this people wanted more and more uh, uh, digitals on a party or on uh, gigs you know uh, they sense? wanted like the screens yes and the... much more uh, yeah sure. um, different things you know what I mean not like a, it's like not, live not, performance not live or... performance at yeah, all they yeah. wanted more um, uh, light and the uh, uh, yeah. Many things very different, much more about uh, connecting, connecting things. Mm-hmm. Does it make sense? I think so. So it yeah. was much more things with uh, with smartphone and everything that you are always connected, so you can make a relationship between the stage and people. You know, yeah. Instead of having human body. Yeah, sure. You 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 know what I mean? I know exactly and what you mean. This is what's happened everywhere, I think. And when did you start teaching? Uh, I always teach. I, I think that it's a part of my career, being an artist and also being a teacher. Uh-huh. I always think about teaching and I, I was very focused on developing the, uh, the movement and developing the, the idea of how you are teaching, how you have to teach, what is a, what is a good teacher, what is a student, what is a technique and what do you need as a, as a performer, as a, as a student, what do you need to to become better and to grow up as a as an artist and uh, so all all these questions are always on my on my head. Yeah, I'm very focused on the developing the qualities of my experience and teaching. Mm-hmm. It's important for me. I start to teach just after the school and uh, I developed classes in Paris when I was living in Paris. I developed a lot of classes and I I I teach for so many aerialists and dancers. I start to be more and more focused with dance. I did a lot of dance. It's a very, it's a strong part of my background, the dance. And uh, then uh, I start to teach in USA. I came to the Aerial Dance Festival in Boulder, and then I start to teach in different uh, European countries, and uh, especially in uh, in UK and Ireland. I was teaching with for Chantal McCormick in um, in Ireland and Lindsay Buche in uh, in UK. Then I was teaching in uh, n- I was a regular teacher for uh, uh, at the circus school in Tilburg at the Acapa. Mm-hmm. So I teach ten years at the from ten years I'm a regular teacher, a kind of guest teacher, but regular regularly. Yeah, I was speaking yes. to my I have a friend who's staying with me right now. He's an artist uh, and he's. Uh, also a professor or like a guest instructor teacher in Tilburg and but he was saying he comes and sees them maybe one time or like for one week and then a couple of months later he'll come in again is this similar to yes, what you do yes i teach uh, one a week per each uh, each month or each two months okay yes okay yes so I mean, there is a lot of guest teachers at the circus school, but there is some of them who are regular. Yeah, who are coming regularly. The, and so I, my question, I think I'm not sure how to ask it yet, but let me think about this. So the difference between because I've also done both, where I've uh, come and just been a guest instructor. You show up, you give courses or a course, and then you leave. And then I've had times where I've gotten to like develop a student over a period of time. Um, do you prefer one over the other? Um, <laughs> it's a long, it's a long answer. Yeah. <laughs> I think, I think it's ve- the, the process of the, having a guest teacher. It's a very interesting process uh-huh. because you have different way of, you, you have different way of teaching and different ideas and different teachers give you new material or new sensations. So this is quite interesting. 
but it could be really disturbing, especially at the beginning. So when you are uh, first year, second year, you need to have more basic instruction mm -hmm. and you need to have more sure idea about what it is, you know, the technique. So, I mean, at the beginning, it's important to have a, some regular teacher who gives you some very strong basic instructions. And then it's important for your um, artistic development to have uh, more new ideas and fresh ideas and people who are coming from different points of view and different countries. So they give you so many new approaches of the work. So this is, this is by the end, this is amazing. And this is what I like. When I was teaching in ACAPA, what I really appreciate was that uh, my students become not my students. They are not only my students. They are, I'm a part of the training of this person. Yes. And it's good for them because they, they, they are becoming an artist. Yes. So it's important to become an artist, to have your own uh, spirit, yes. you know? So it's important that uh, different people give you some, some materials, some food uh, to develop your own quality, you know? And sometimes when you have the same, the same teacher for four years, for example, you are a bit less, you are, you are a bit too much influenced by mm -hmm. the same person. Yeah. So does it make sense, my answer? <laughs> Completely. Yeah, 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 totally. Because I think you have a really nice way of giving people space, like giving enough instruction to let us, uh, in the workshop this weekend, to let us kind of explore. But you also were clear enough where we had a framework or we had something to work inside of. The research we did this weekend, the research part where you would say, okay, we're going to think about the spine or close your eyes. These kinds of exercises, where did they come from? From me, actually, because I did a lot of dance. Mm. So I think if you are doing so many workshops in dance, there is already many, many uh, way of doing this or teaching or, you know, so you can approach, I think it's more a dance approach. And mm -hmm. also after it's my own experience, because I think after all this time, you know, it's normal to have experiences. So it's good. Uh, again, I did this for um, 25 years, 30 years. So it's normal to have uh, maybe knowledge or yeah, you know what yeah, I mean? Completely. So I developed these uh, ideas through my experiences and I learn a lot from my students. <laughs> yeah, I always joke that I have my students and I tell them, you know, like, you can do it, but also you can mess it up. And either way, I will steal it and make something out of it. Because sometimes when people mess up, it's like the most fascinating thing. Yes, it is. To see. It is. This is true. That's why also it's uh, nice for me when I'm doing a workshop. I always try to combine uh, more beginner students with more advanced. Because I think we have always very... We, have, we, have, we learn from each other a lot. This is something really interesting to me because I, have, I know some teachers who don't like to mix the levels. They find it either distracting or difficult to teach if someone is a beginner and then someone is more advanced. But you seem to really appreciate it. Yes, yes, really. And also I think that as, a, as an advance, okay, it's always nice when you start as a beginner and then you become an intermediate and you become an advance. And suddenly when you have a new beginners, you realize uh, the way that you already did and, <laughs> and it's it's very nice so I have some students who become uh, who start as a, a beginner and then they uh, they have they, they are coming in a workshop and they have new beginners and they are realizing wow oh, this is a process and this is all that I learned from now on and it's it's amazing to see and then when you are when you are able to to describe what you are doing, you realize that you know. Uh -huh. it, it makes sense. Yeah. So it's important also for the process to to give uh, to give feedback to people and to realize ah yes I understand this and I have I, I have now this and I'm, I feel that I bring something and I always uh, one a part of my uh, teaching is to let people talk and I think it's really important to to talk and to realize and to explain with word what we were doing and what was our sensation and how we felt and what we saw. And I think all this process uh, to talk about what, what was the sensation that we had or what we saw when we were watching people doing something, it's, it's such an amazing process and it's very important. Mm -hmm. for the, for the, on my work, it's something very important and I let people really talk and they, they can explain and they can share 
and this sharing it's really a, a huge part of my of my workshop of my teaching this podcast is brought to you by the artist athlete did you know that the artist athlete is more than just a podcast it's a growing online resource for students of the aerial arts and to deepen their journey to badassery by accessing techniques approved by physical therapists and master coaches in the industry. Our current spotlight is on the Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment, a practical manual for hanging upside down. This online manual is a step-by-step guide. It is complete with photos, videos, and exercises that you can implement immediately to help you gain the strength and awareness you need for an aerial practice that promotes shoulder health and longevity and good posture upright so you don't walk around like a gorilla. But don't just take my word for it. Here's circus physical therapist Dr. Jen Crane of Cirque Physio to tell you more. The Fundamentals of Aerial Alignment is an absolute must-have for every aerialist of every level. I can't even tell you how many shoulder injuries I treat that are a direct result of rushing past the basics and attempt to get a trick too soon. In the manual, Shannon deconstructs the fundamentals, including the correct muscular engagement to safely arrive in these positions and the rationale for why it matters. Of course, in addition to all of these fabulous pearls of wisdom, the book is also ridiculously fun to read. It's been lovingly garnished with the Shannon humor we all know and love. Thanks, Jen. Cirque Physio is also featured in the book to give scientific insight into why it all works. Pick up your copy today by going to theartistathlete.com and clicking e-manuals. Listeners of the podcast can get a 10% discount by typing in the offer code podcast at checkout. Again, that's theartistathlete.com, offer code podcast. podcast. Now, back to the show. Um you have an aerial dance festival? Yes. Every year. When did that start? Uh when it's a ninth edition okay. this year. So it means it started 10 almost 10 years ago, 9 years ago. And what gave you the inspiration to start this? Uh the aerial dance festival in Boulder for sure when uh-huh. I was teaching there. Uh, when Nancy Smith invited me to teach, I, I came here and uh, as a French, Euro, French, first French girl who came here, I was just... Oh my just, God, I oh. bet they all were just like, wow! It was amazing for me to arrive and to watch to all these people and to feel and to see. It was so different than what we used to do in France. It was just for me, it was a, a new world, you know, it's opened my mind. And it was a cultural shock at the beginning because it's <laughs> so, so different. You could imagine it was almost um, 14 years ago. So it was a huge, huge experience for me. And it changed my idea of many, many things. And uh, then I, re- I, I, I realized that there is nothing like that in Europe, actually. There is nothing like that in Europe, in France. And, and uh, I came back to France and decided to... one day to build up something like this. And uh, I, was, I was working a lot with uh, Chantal McCormick and Lynn Sebuche. We were working together. We were doing a, um, a new show. I was choreographing and directing a performance for uh, Fidget Fit. And then we were talking about this because we met all, the, all each other in, uh, in USA. So we were talking together and we were thinking about this aerial dance festival and then we were thinking, wow, we have to do this in Europe because this is fantastic and magic. So uh, Chantal started in Ireland and Lindsay started in UK and I started in France. So we were all started together in the same time, same year in each country. Mm-hmm. And we tried to develop our festival and I was... I was um, teaching to, to Brighton, I was teaching to Letterkenny, and uh, they came to teach to France, and we were sharing the different ideas, and yes, and now each festival grew up, so this is how it's happened. And for me, it was, yes, it's, it was very important to make something like this in France. Why? I make a difference between aerial dance and circus training, uh-huh. and uh, there is no aerial dance ideas in France, actually. Uh-huh. Especially when I started, and even now it's more about circus, it's about an aerial, it's about circus, otherwise you have some uh, other uh, technical work from dance. But not really, this aerial dance movement, it's not so clear in, in France. 
even a little bit more in Europe because it's different, you know, Anglo-Saxon have different point of view, but in France it's really no, no developed. So it was important for me to make something like this, really focus only on aerial, because this is my mind, this is my, my focus actually, this is where I am and this is what I really have an interest on develop the aerial uh, uh, world. So it's very important for me to do it and it's really important for me that it's happen and it exists and uh, to run this festival every summer, it's one of my uh, focus actually. What do you think the difference or what would you say the difference between circus and aerial dance is? Mm. It's different, it's uh, aesthetic differences. So there is a lot of aesthetic differences and also technique differences. Especially in, in, again, in France or in, yeah, we have, um, how do you call this? Code codification. We have a clear codification for circus, actually. Yeah. Even if it's more floating now, because, uh, many things, uh, uh, the circus, uh, bring, take many things from other arts. So, uh, from dance and theater and music and everything, it's much more crossing and mm -hmm. floating together. And, but basically, uh, circus still uh, have some ideas about the, the performance, the body, the, the techniques, the pushing the technique in a certain level. So, and in dance, you have not this. It's a bit different. It's more the choreography, the sensibility come from more more the movement, qualities of the movement, and not this uh, uh, high level technique things. You, you know what yeah. I mean? So this is one of something. Who I feel that it's different, and um, my my focus it's qualities of your movement on the sensibilities on the history and uh, everything that you want to to talk about, but it's come from the the movement and the the body and the sens sensibility of the body and the this is this is my uh, and mm -hmm. this is much more my focus actually. Yes. It's interesting because I also, I mean, like what you say is there is this convergence now. I mean, like I went to Cirque du Mam three years ago now, two years, and I feel like half of what I saw was breakdancing or had like these very dance or theatrical elements. So it's almost like I don't even know where aerial dance ends and circus begins anymore. But it is very clear when you see a piece that's an aerial dance piece and the circus act. You think so, no? Sometimes, most of yeah. the time, yeah. 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 For sure. For sure now things are more, um, it's less, a, a, a bit less clear for sure. Mm -hmm. But still, still there is this, uh, you can make a difference between uh, uh, aesthetic circus choices and more aerial dance choices. Yeah. But it's a, it's a huge conversation and it's also... You know, it's sometimes you, you, you try to, to develop your technique and you, you push your body for the technical materials that you want to have. And then you add some different ideas. And it's, yeah, I, I won't say that it's, it will be much easier to explain in France. It's pour eux, pour eux. You, you know what I mean? There is not a clear, there is not a clear line and, uh, because now things are more going from one way to another yeah, way. So yeah, yeah. there is more this kind of crossing things yeah. between. It's not like uh, there is one line and you are from one way or to, or to the other way and you cannot be, you know. If, yeah. if you are right, you cannot be. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, For sure. it's now it's a bit different. It's more crossing like this. But we, we know where the circus come from and this, uh, all these aesthetic choices. Yeah. And we know where the dance comes from. Yeah. And also there is something else that it's important for me is that in dance, you have more vocabulary. You can develop much more vocabulary mm. because you are less restricted by the movement. In circus, you are taking a long, long time to learn one trick. Yes. You know? Yes. And this is a huge difference. Yes. Because in circus, you need to take all this time to learn tricks because they are very difficult tricks. Yes. And it takes you a long, long time to, to <laughs> yes. cut it, you know? Oh, so I know. this is a, a strong difference uh -huh. for me. But for sure, I, I love both, you know? I of really, course. I love, I love, I, my, my background is circus and I love to train a lot and to, to be strong and to have a strong technique and this is, it's, it was really very important for me. 
And then I did a lot of dance during my career. And then I really feel that what was important for me, it was uh, to developing the aerial way of thinking, mm-hmm. to developing the aerial community and to found out we can cross everything and to mix this and to, to develop this in a good way. This yeah. is my focus. Yeah, I think you're doing a really nice job of it. <laughs> I always come back to this question and the reason I named all of this project, the artist athlete, is in aerial dance or in circus, you have a certain level of technicality you have to, or a technique that you have to have. And then you have quality of movement, you have these emotions or things that you want to convey. Now my English is getting bad. (laughs) You have these other kind of uh, things that you want to say with what you're doing. And so how do you blend the two? Or where is the crossing there? What do you mean? Yeah. I think we talked about this a bit in the workshop too. It's like uh, when I get into technique, it's like I have like my, like I know what to do with the technique and the splits and everything. And then when you have like the movement exercises, it becomes a bit easier to just move. But to bring the two together. Yes. This is the challenge, right? This is a challenge. Yeah. This is a problem of the circus artist, actually. <laughs> <laughs> this is our I'm problem. I'm glad I'm not forever. alone. <laughs> <laughs> it's yes, for sure. It's how you how you you can put all this emotion, all this sensation, and everything that you want to put in in your technique, and how you you pass over the technique to uh, to express what you really want to express. This is for sure the big challenging the more challenging things that you have to learn during your uh, during your studies actually and then during your career yeah yes yes and it's always it's it's a process and it's never stopped you know never 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 for me i always learn something new and i try to do uh to to pass over my technique always and always to make everything becoming more and more organic and this is this is my way but it's uh it's a way. Yeah. This is a way. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm not sure there is a goal. It's just there is a process. <laughs> Always. Yeah. I'm not sure we can arrive. Yes. We're just no. on the way and we're just learning every every time. Yeah. Yes. For sure. What's your favorite performance you've ever done? You mean me, myself, as a performer? Um Yes. Which performance did I prefer to perform? Yes. Um, the Woman in the Moon uh-huh. was a performance that I did with my husband on a d- red dress uh-huh. in a hoop. I dressed a beautiful red dress and uh, we did a duet. We performed it in, uh, in USA and we performed this, this duet for maybe 10 years together. Okay. And we performed it in many, many different countries. And uh, it was a relationship. It was a kind of duet about love, you know, between yeah. two partners. <laughs> but it, yes, this is my favorite act because it, it was unique and original. And uh, it was about uh, dressing a hoop with a, with a costume. And this is also one of my focus to uh, in my process as an artist. So... Uh, it was my favorite, for, definitely it was my favorite act, my nice. favorite performance, or, yes. Piece. And your favorite to choreograph for somebody else? Uh, for somebody else, what was my favorite? <laughs> now I'm working in a, in a new piece mm-hmm. for, uh, with two girls for my, for my own company. And uh, I think that uh, I'm now I'm becoming a choreographer and not anymore a performer. And I think that it's changed on my head something that I won't be in stage anymore and I will be only out of the stage and I will be only watching. And uh, I realize that now maybe I have enough background and experience to do it and to be able to do it in a, in a way that I feel that this is where I want to go. And this is where I can push uh, artists on stage to go. And I feel I feel much more confident now. And I think that my the new piece that I'm doing right now uh, is the best uh, the best piece for uh, that I did. 
That's a wonderful. Yes. It's always nice to feel like the thing you're doing now is the best you've ever done. You know, you never want your best work to be in the past. No, no, no. You're right. You're That's right. really nice. No, this is good. In your company, do you hire dancers or circus artists? Uh, it depends on mm. what I want to do. Mm. Uh, my last piece that I did, uh, we were three on stage. And I was the only circus artist, and there were two dancers. Okay. And I'm basically used to work with dancers. Mm -hmm. Yes, I really like it. I really enjoy to, to work with dancers. Because also, because my focus is more about uh, movement, qualities right. and movement, instead of... I'm not starting a piece from the dramaturgic point of view, but I'm much more starting a piece with uh, uh, qualities and movement and experimentation and motions and... Uh, uh, my sensibility uh, arrives by the movement. Mm -hmm. I mean, in a way, you know? Yeah, that makes so, sense. So, yes, yes. Completely. I'm not a dramaturge person. Yeah. I'm not starting with a very clear ideas about this is what I want to say. And I think this is also very French, this approach. You think? I think so. I'm not sure. I don't know if I want to say this like... <laughs> as a solid statement about life. But I think that like the French sensibility, from what I understand, is very much this like organic, it comes from movement, it comes from feelings, it comes from this, rather than um, the more like dramaturgical, like we're going to sit down and find source material and research and this is what it's going to be about and now how do we explain this thing, do you know? It seems... To me this way. Okay, maybe so, I'm wrong. So may, I don't know if you are right or wrong, but for sure I am like this. But this is your approach. <laughs> I if am one of French, these persons. Friend, yeah. At the very beginning of your career, yes. what advice would you give yourself? If you now could go back all those years ago, what would you say? To myself. Yeah. <laughs> You know what we, what, we, what we don't learn at school, or especially when I was young, we don't learn how to sell ourselves. Mm. So this is a very, it was a difficult for me during all my career to sell myself, to, to, to call, to say, ah, oh, hello, I'm Fred Dem, and I have this beautiful performance. And could, <laughs> do you want, do you have some work for me? Or, you know, so yeah. this was... Awful. All my career, I, I never know how to, how to promote myself, you uh -huh. know. And yeah. this, I think that we, I miss this during my studies. And um, if I had this opportunity, I will give, give me this advice, you know, how to sell, how to phone, how to present, how to be here, what, what I have to do. And, you know, yeah, all these yeah, things totally. around, around the work that, and, and also I will, I will let me know how difficult it is, all this promotion, all this, you know, it's not only being an artist, it's everything you have to do around, who is sometimes so difficult and who takes you so many, so long, so many times, and, you know, so this is... I know, uh, absolutely. This yeah. is something that I, w I would love to know <laughs> before to start this process, <laughs> but maybe it's not good to know because then... <laughs> then you don't do it. <laughs> you don't this do This joke, it. if I knew how hard it was, I never would start, right? Maybe. <laughs> well, no, you're right. <laughs> well, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was such a pleasure. You're welcome. To speak. <laughs> and we'll cut out all the parts that neither of us make sense. Yes, for sure. Yeah. You have to. <laughs> yeah, we will. That was my interview with the great Fred Deb. I want to talk a little bit. Actually, I want to talk a lot about this idea of circus versus aerial dance, because I think these discussions about what circus is and is not are important. And I actually have been thinking a lot about them throughout my time and participation in this art form. Um, so I wanted to just give some reflections about it, because aerial arts are continuing to gain popularity and studios are popping up and some people practice just for fun. And I think that's great. It's great that aerial disciplines like fabric and aerial hoop are becoming more mainstream. Not everyone who goes to a dance class is going to dance for the New York City Ballet, and not everybody who takes a painting class is going to be the next Monet. That totally rhymes, and I didn't even mean it to. But these people are perfectly well within their rights to call themselves 
dancers or painters and to identify with the thing that feeds their creative outlet. And yet, in the circus world, sometimes, and I've actually uh, fallen victim to this kind of like, I would now call it maybe elitism, but this idea that I worked so hard for so many years and I've performed and I've hung from my feet, you know, 20 meters in the air and I am an artist and how can these people call themselves aerialist? But just because aerial isn't paying your bills doesn't mean you're not enjoying it. It doesn't mean you're not deriving some kind of creative pleasure from it. And so it's well within your right if you're a recreational aerialist, to call yourself an aerialist. I mean, you don't even really need my permission right now. You should do it. However, if you are doing circus, that's a really funny phrase, like if you're doing circus, uh, but if you're doing circus for fun or to help you stay fit, you should also know that you are taking part in an art form. And this art form has history, and it has references, and philosophical and aesthetic conversations surrounding it. And we take those conversations seriously. And taking them seriously is how we can elevate circus. It becomes not just a physical pursuit or viewed as cheap entertainment, but intellectual and aesthetic discourse. And the professionals who do it are hardworking and incredibly intelligent But I hear so often, like, oh, circus is dead, it's over, this circus closed, the circus is going out of business, and circus, just like theater or dance or any other art, is part of culture, and cultural shifts happen. I hear people making these claims, and I'm like, guys, no, it's not dead, it's just changing, and it's the job of the artists and the practitioners to be aware and study and respond to those changes. All that is to say, I think it's super interesting to explore these lines between circus and theater and dance and aerial dance, so I'm going to keep doing that. For Fred, the distinction comes mostly from aesthetics, though she also mentioned this idea that circus training is about the trick, that artists will practice for years to achieve maybe just one trick, whereas aerial dance has an emphasis on quality of movement. If you want to take this out of the world of like woo-woo emotion, if you're having trouble visualizing this, um, there's a really great interview, I'll put it in the show notes, of another podcast where uh, they interview an Australian acrobat whose name is Louis West, and he talks about this idea of horizontal training, or that you have a skill that you can do, for example, a forward roll, and you explore all of the different ways that you can do a forward roll. So can you do a forward roll from sitting, from standing, to sitting, to standing, with your legs straight, with one leg bent, touching your tongue to your nose? All of these different challenges that are that don't really require any more strength or flexibility, but do require some creativity and attention and knowledge of the movement you're doing. So I hope that you can take that idea and apply it. Thank you for listening to the show today. Uh, If you want to get in touch with me, you can visit my website, www.theartistathlete.com. I'm on Instagram at the underscore artist underscore athlete. If you like the podcast, subscribe, rate, review on iTunes, and make sure to tell all your friends, fans, and enemies. Next week on the show, I'll be interviewing Doug Stewart who is the founder of Cirque Us, about their upcoming New England tour. See you then.